Hello there, and welcome to the very first episode of the Release Readiness Live series for Winter 19. So, my name is Arabella David, and you might know me from some of the webinars that have been happening from Salesforce developers. But today, I am thrilled to be sharing the Developer Preview Live with this excellent panel of product managers and evangelists. So, we're thrilled to be able to carve out some time from Dreamforce Prep. Uh, to talk about the release uh, notes that are out there already and what's everybody's favorite features for developers today. So uh, before we get started, the best part about these kinds of broadcasts is that you can ask your own questions to anybody as they're talking about the demos or their features. So don't forget to use the hashtag Salesforce Live or at mention us at Salesforce Devs if you want to ask any questions that I'll then ask the panel here. So before, um, before we dive into all the slides, let's do some introductions. Do you want to start with you, Chris? Sure. Uh, I'm Chris Castle. I'm a, a developer advocate for Heroku. i um, going to talk about all the new stuff that we've been releasing and are going to release uh, leading up to Dreamforce. And I know you're really busy building all of the demos for the developer forest yeah. in Dreamforce. So thanks again for taking the time to come out here. You're welcome. Excited to be here. <laughs> and we've got Rohit. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Rohit, and I'm a product manager on the platform team. Today, I'm going to talk about some of the many enhancements that we're bringing to the Salesforce developer experience. And I'm excited to show you some of them. It's always one of the most popular aspects. Whenever we do these release readiness uh, broadcasts, people are super interested in it. So we're really happy to have you here today. So am I. <laughs> and then we have Gayathri. Hey, everyone. My name is Gayathri, or Gigi. Um, so I'm a product manager on Community Cloud, and I'm super excited to show you all the exciting features we have for Winter 19. We've got a bunch of new uh, theming and community sessions at Dreamforce. So yes. let's dive into those later. Yeah. OK. And then finally, we have the famous Greg. <laughs> okay, hey everyone, I, I'm the famous Greg. I'm, I'm, I'm Greg Rose. I'm the product manager for Lightning Components, and I'm going to be talking not only about Lightning Components, but a few uh, other neat things that we have in store. And I may even be giving you a sneak peek of something to come in the future. <laughs> roadmap, you say? Uh, roadmap, I did say. But I'm not allowed to say it yet because you've not talked about the forward-looking statement, Arabella. I did not talk about the forward-looking statement, and thank you for the reminder. So um, as you know, as with any communication we have from Salesforce, you need to remember to make any purchases uh, based on what's currently available. So this entire broadcast um, is considered a forward-looking statement. So with that out of the way, oh, if you want to read the entire thing, it's online. And we'll show the link if anybody asks. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start. And then uh, Chris, do you want to take it away with what's new for Heroku? Yeah, definitely. So um, lots of fun and exciting stuff coming for Heroku. First off, uh, we have um, uh, VPN connections, site-to-site -site VPN connections for private spaces. So we've had. Uh, uh, VPC peering between AWS connections, uh, AWS VPCs, and Heroku private spaces. And now we uh, have VPN connections, so you can go site to site to an on-prem data center or to even a Google VPC, which is pretty exciting. Next, we have um, internal routing. And this is kind of paired with um, these, uh, the, the um, site to site VPN. So internal routing uh, lets you designate an app in a Heroku private space as a private app and it only can communicate internally on a private uh, subnet. Um, so that's great for uh, microservices architectures. Next thing we have is um, builds and deploys on, uh, of Docker images on Heroku. So we've had deploys for a while, um, and now you can actually build your Docker image on Heroku. And then lastly, we have um, syncing protected health information data with, with Salesforce. So this is uh, Heroku Shield Connect. You can sync data back and forth between um, your uh, Heroku Postgres database and Salesforce. So let's let's jump into a little demo. Uh, I'll show you show you a little bit of what I have. So just as a refresher for those of you that that know Heroku, this is um, a Heroku private space with a Heroku app running in it. Um, pretty simple setup. Uh, that Heroku private space again is a is a managed subnet that Heroku manages for you. Um, and as I mentioned, we've had VPC peering for um, I think about a year now with AWS VPCs. Um, so you can talk securely between your Heroku private space and an AWS VPC. But now we have this 
uh, VPN connection. Um, and as I mentioned, it could be site to site, like with, at your on-prem data center, or it could be uh, a Google VPC now, which is pretty cool because you can use all these other services um, in different clouds, either the AWS's cloud or Google's cloud, or really any cloud that has a VPN, uh, site to site VPN connection. And that's new. I'm pointing out the arrow. That is new, <laughs> new arrow. But this is a pretty simple, like little architecture here. Let's let's jump into something that's more realistic. Um, so here's here's a, a bit of a more realistic example, right? So I've got two apps now in my Heroku private space. I've got an API gateway that's exposed publicly to the internet, and I've got a backend service um, that that uh, is maybe one of my microservices. And then on the left here, um, I'm going to use Google BigQuery. Um, Google BigQuery, you know, is a, is a service that lets you query millions of rows of, of data, um, and uh, really quickly, and kind of take use the power of um, uh, innovative database technologies. And so I'm going to um, make a query against Google BigQuery. Uh, maybe you've got you know, some, some customer data in there, and so it's private, and you want that, that query and the results of that query to travel over the VPN connection. Uh, you don't want that going over the public internet. So that's, that's why this is a great, great use case. Um, and then as on the right there, I have an example of something you could do. You could have AWS Redshift. right? We've had this for a while. You can use AWS services. But let's jump into um, uh, a live demo of querying Google BigQuery from, from a Heroku private space. And that again, that data traveling over a secure VPN connection. All right, so uh, I'm going to jump in here. And let's see, what are we going to do first? So I need to. Um, Need to deploy. You want to go full screen on that? Uh, I can make it bigger. Yeah. Maybe a little bit bigger. Is that better? Perfect. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to deploy a service. Um, so we can actually do the git push Heroku master, which I mentioned earlier. So we can deploy a uh, Docker container now to Heroku. And so I practiced this before because it's a live demo and everything's up to date. So I'm going to make another commit. Nope, that's not going to work. So we'll skip the deploy of the of the Docker container, but we can jump into uh, actually querying this. So I've got this deployed, luckily, separately. So here's our. You can see on the top here. Hopefully you can see that um, it says API Gateway. This is the, the the gateway that we're querying, and the the data set that I'm going to query in BigQuery is a public data set that that Google makes available. It's um, all GitHub commits um, from. I don't know, the beginning of GitHub time. So it goes all the way back to um, the early 2000s, I think. And what's kind of cool here is that you can, let's see, so I change this to commits. Uh, we could, for instance, like query different GitHub orgs and see how many commits they have. So like, let's look at the, the Heroku GitHub org. So um, this is this just queried like 200 million or something like that rows of data and found that hey you know Heroku's been making open source commits you know this is just open source commits it's not any private uh, commits and there's like 400,000. What about like uh, Mozilla right they're another company that supports um, and contributes a lot to open source um, 459,000 or something like that uh, maybe Apache you know a company that hosts many many open source projects almost. Um, I'm sorry, the, almost a million commits there. Uh, so just a quick example of uh, data, again, traveling over this private VPN connection um, and uh, using these third-party kind of services outside of your, your Heroku private space. Um, and that's all we got for Heroku. Wow, that was a lightning quick demo there. <laughs> <laughs> Did I speak too fast? Jam well, through I think, it. I think the, the biggest thing is um, there's a lot of developers out there that um, have been working on Salesforce for ages, yeah. but they're fairly new to Heroku. Yeah. Um, and so I think the question I would have for you is, if I'm somebody who's super experienced at things like Apex and Visual Force, and yeah. I mean, while it does look interesting, like how do I, as a Salesforce developer, really get in there and start learning about Heroku? Yeah. So, so two main ways. First way is, is Trailhead. I would, if you just go to Trailhead and search for Heroku, all the um, Heroku modules and content come up there, and you can. Uh, there's even some um, uh, live like uh, courses where you can actually you're deploying things to Heroku mm -hmm. in there. Um, another way is to go to um, uh, devcenter.heroku.com/start, 
And that is if you just want to jump in with Java or Ruby or Python or PHP or whatever your language is, you can just kind of jump in there and deploy your very first Heroku app um, for free. Great. Yeah. And if you're, um, if you're coming to Dreamforce, people can ask you things personally, right? Yes. Yeah, we'll be at Dreamforce. <laughs> and if you want to see what we're talking about at Dreamforce, you can go to heroku.com slash Dreamforce. OK, yeah. great. Thank you. So at the very end of this broadcast, we'll also have a trail mix. So a lot of the different modules and badges that we'll be talking about today will be contained in there. So if people mention modules over the course of this, don't worry about it. We've got you covered. <laughs> so um, thanks again, Chris. I'm yeah, sure we'll thanks. have a lot of questions coming in as we go on with the broadcast. Great, yeah. But we'll wait for those. All right. Um, Happy and answer. In the, of course, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> in the meantime, um, we'll move on to Salesforce DX. So um, Rohit, I, um, thanks for, we did a couple of Reddit AMAs before mm -hmm. and some webinars. And you've been so great on answering so many of the questions from the developers. So we're really happy to have you here today to talk about what's new for Winter 19. So, sure. Um, there are a bunch of exciting updates to uh, Salesforce developer experience. Starting with Scratch Orgs, uh, we had a lot of developers ask us over the last several releases that they wanted to have a personal dev hub so that they could try out all the new tools and technologies uh, that we are announcing with Salesforce DX. Uh, as part of this Winter 19 update, we listened to their feedback, and we are now making available dev hubs in DE orgs. So anyone can spin up one of these DE, DE orgs and try out the new packaging capabilities, the new CLI, uh, the Salesforce CLI tool, as well as the extensions to VS Code. We are also making Scratch Orgs more configurable than ever, with the launch of 10 new features in the Scratch definition files, such as chatbots, IoT, uh, knowledge, and live agent. There are also, there's also a new way to set up settings within your Scratch Orgs. For those of you who've used org preferences in the past, this will, they will be delighted to hear that there is now an expanded set of options available, all of those backed by the Metadata API. Speaking of the Metadata API, um, let's talk a little bit about the Metadata Coverage Report. Earlier this year, we announced the Metadata Coverage Report as a means to make visible uh, the different metadata types that are available across all our different channels basically the different operations that developers perform on the Salesforce platform. Um, as part of that, uh, the, sales, the, uh, the coverage report now has a new home. And it's now hosted on the developer website rather than having someone log into an org to view this page. Yes. <laughs> I think people love that. <laughs> There's also more coverage information than before. We have added four new channels so that you can see how this coverage is along uh, managed packages, classic packages, Apex Metadata API, and chain sets. And you can also check out known issues and, and any uh, the status of these issues. Finally, by far my favorite update is that you can now view which metadata type is supported in a Scratch org. All you have to do is click on the metadata type in the report and see if it's supported or not and what the sample Scratch definition file would be. You can simply copy and paste this and put it into your own uh, Scratch definition file to create Scratch orgs. Let's talk about unlock packaging. In the previous release, we announced unlock packaging as the means to organize metadata in your production org so that you could track the origin of the metadata. But more importantly, you could version this metadata and have a clear package upgrade process. With the Winter 19 update, we are making this generally available. Uh, we've also streamlined, streamlined some of the package CLI commands so that uh, the managing project is much easier than before, and you don't have to deal with any of the cryptic IDs because you can reference things with package aliases. There's also now a simplified way to find and install dependent packages um, so that the setup of your Scratch org is very automated. Finally, we've now added support for moving metadata between packages. This is to support the refactor use case and was very frequently asked by our developer community. Yes. So let me show you uh, what this looks like with the means of a demo. What I have, Go ahead. What I have set up here um, is a fitness manager app, um, the version 0.1 that I've built. And I've installed this in an org. Let's take a look at some of the components of this. Um, when I view the components, you will see the usual suspects, a bunch of custom fields, visual force pages, apps, tabs, uh, page layouts, and so on. Let's find, let me get your attention to a couple of different 
um, metadata objects here. One is an Apex class called the Arabic Exercise Controller, and another one is a field that I've defined on a custom object called uh, Recipe. Now, as you can see, this package has gotten quite bloated over the last uh, several weeks as I've added more and more features. And I'd like to refactor this so that I can pull some of these uh, extension features and put it in a, their own extension package. Now, moving metadata from a package is quite simple. You simply delete the metadata, create a new package version, and install that package version. That's exactly what I've done in this staged org. I have created a new package version. You can see I took a few different package versions to get this right, and I have this set up in a scratch org. And I've removed the two metadata objects that I referenced there. If I search for Apex uh, Arabic Exercise Controller, I don't find that on the page. Um, and if I find, if I look for the recipe field, um, I do see the recipe field here. However, it's marked as deprecated. And this is par for the course. We don't delete um, objects that are referenced in the code because they are backed by, there may be or customer data belonging uh, in this org for that particular Cubs custom object or field. Now, the tricky part used to be, uh, once this metadata was deleted, how to reintroduce it into a new package. Just moving it into a new package, creating a package version, would mean that that package would fail installation. Um, and then there were tedious workarounds that people often use, such as uh, backing up all the custom object data, uh, creating a new object, and then re-importing all the data as part of the new object. With the latest changes, all of those things are a thing of the past. All I have to do is simply create a new package. In this case, I've created an extension package, version 0.1, and I have installed, um, as, part of these, uh, as part of this package, I have installed um, both the Apex controller, let's view that out here, and I have uh, the recipe field as well, if I can find it here. Um, Right there. Let's click and see where this field belongs to now. And voila, you can see that the install package associated here is now the extension package rather than the base package. So the system has smartly uh, associated this package, this metadata type, with a new package so that it's a very simple transition to move things between packages. So now that we've talked about packaging, let's talk a little bit about the new updates for Salesforce extensions for VS Code. In a previous release, we had announced an Apex debugger, a replay debugger capability, um, and in winter 19, we are taking that to generally available status. With this, you can do debug any org that you want for free. You can also explore tests within Visual Force Code, uh, within, Vision, within Visual Studio Code, uh, so that you can navigate all your different test methods within your different test classes but you can also quickly get to a test failure, an assertion failure within your test results. And lastly, uh, we have brought org-based development to all our um, new tooling, uh, such as the Salesforce CLI and the VS Code. This means that you can use Visual Studio Code for developing against any org, not just scratch orgs, but also sandboxes, DE orgs, and trial orgs. If you use the force.com IDE plugin, there is absolutely no work for you to transition over to the VS Code, um, VS Code extension. Let me show you how this works in action. So what I have set up here is a Salesforce DX project. Um, and one of the parameters that I passed along when creating this package was uh, for, so that this manifest folder could be created. As part of the manifest, a package.xml was also uh, scaffolded for me. Um, I've updated the, the package.xml to just reference the Apex class. What I've also done here is attach this to my sandbox org. Now, all that I have to do is right click on this and retrieve source from my org. And just like that, I've retrieved all the different components that were scoped in this package.xml. What will also be familiar to you is that there's the same project structure as it was with developing with packages. So I have all my classes that just got 
uh, pull down from my sandbox org. And let me just look at one of the different one of the Apex classes that I was working on that I found a bug in earlier. Uh, obviously, here my math is incorrect. I shouldn't be multiplying 600 minutes to an hour. Uh, so let me make the change. Uh, and let me deploy this back into my sandbox org. There are a few ways to do that. Either I can right click on the file and then just simply deploy it to the source or deploy it to the sandbox org, or I can do that along with the package directory, uh, sorry, the class directory so that all my classes get deployed as in one go. Or I can also simply right click on the package.xml and deploy all the source that's been scoped by my package.xml. In this case, let me just go ahead and do this with the single file. And it's just that easy for developers. Uh, past the development stage, we also have something for release management. Uh, now you can simply go to the Salesforce CLI, and there are a couple of different commands that are available uh, to make deployments easier to any org. All you have to do is try out the new source deploy commands uh, point to a package.xml and the org that you want to deploy the source to. It can be a production org or it can be any other sandbox, like a full sandbox. And just like that, release managers are also happy with some of these updates. Nice. You forgot to say boom and then drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> 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 Thanks for that. So I think as you were going through these slides, um, I'm looking at Twitter and people are saying yay. Good. So <laughs> I'm, I'm excited as well. So. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you are. So thanks for showing that to us. I mean, mm -hmm. I know that based on previous um, conversations we've been having with developers in person and online, there have been so many people demanding this kind of stuff in regards to packaging as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact that it is GA and free, um, I think I can hear I can hear the cheering. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so thanks again for that. Um, I think, uh, oh, we have a really good um, tweet coming in from uh, Squire Kirshner. It says, uh, woohoo, VS Code is my new favorite IDE. <laughs> and now developing against any org is a lifesaver. So. <laughs> so thanks for being the first one to show this off to the world. It's my pleasure. <laughs> so thanks for that. We'll ask more questions um, in, as we get to them. So um, I think next up, we've got uh, Gigi yes. talking about <laughs> what's new for Community Cloud. So yes. take it away. Hey folks, very excited to be here. So for those of you who are not as familiar with Community Cloud, just a very quick intro. Uh, Community Cloud is your digital experience platform that you can use to extend Salesforce and build these really nice, rich experiences for your customers, partners, and employees. Um, in fact, if you are interested in checking it out, I believe we have a release readiness live uh, next week that's mm -hmm. going to go over all of the Community Cloud features I'm gonna be talking about in more detail. So definitely look out for that. Um, so for what's new in Winter 19, we have four key themes, uh, kicking it off with our digital experience platform. This is really the foundational platform that's used to power all of these different use cases. And uh, one of the things I'm really excited about is themes. Uh, in the last release, we had four out-of-the-box themes that uh, we had launched that you could use to control the visual look and feel for your community. But starting in Winter 19, uh, you as a developer can go in, create your own standalone themes. Uh, you can go ahead and package them and deploy them on App Exchange, or maybe share them one on one with your customer. Um, and really, you can just do this either declaratively in the builder or programmatically, which is great. Um, the second piece I wanted to talk about was our CMS offering. So we've been investing pretty heavily in this area. In the last couple of releases, uh, you might have heard about our CMS Connect offering that lets you bring in content from an external CMS system. So whether it's Adobe or WordPress, you name it, you can get it in there. Uh, but now, new in Winter 19, you can go ahead and author, publish, and archive content right from within the Community Cloud uh, platform itself, which is awesome. And I'll show you a demo of how that works pretty soon. Um, and then you have audience targeting. We all know how important it is to have a beautifully personalized experience for your customers. And uh, with audience targeting, we've really focused on uh, giving you the flexibility to create complex, nuanced audiences uh, with the introduction of operators. So next, uh, let's talk about our next use case, self-service. If you have a self-service community you're developing for, do be sure to check out Threaded Discussions. This has been a feature that's been very heavily requested. As the name implies, uh, with Threaded Discussions, you can actually have replies posted in line to your posts, up to three levels deep. 
Next on, we have customer portal. Uh, one of the features I'm super excited about is the flow for guest users. So what is a flow? A flow is a way for you to walk your customer through a complex business process, like maybe applying for a credit card. And in the past, we had flows for authenticated users, but starting in winter 19, you can actually have flows for guest users. Um, so that means if you wanted to have, let's say a registration process and you wanted to get more information from your customers during the registration process, a guest flow would be a great fit for that. Last but not the least, uh, we have partner relationship management or PRM communities. Uh, one of the features that I really like here is co-branding. Uh, so with this, your customers can enable their partners to upload branding assets. So when they send out that beautiful or create that you know, beautiful email template uh, to send out to their contacts and their leads, they can actually leverage these branding assets as well. All right, enough jibber jabber, let's go over to the demo, <laughs> which I think is the exciting part here. Uh, so for the demo today, um, you know, I've put together a community called Rad Sports for you. So Rad Sports, they are the makers of athletic footwear and shoes, like a Nike or an Adidas, if you will. Um, and so here you see they have this beautiful community they've created here um, exclusively with our native content and CMS Connect. And uh, one of the things Rad Sports is doing is they're going ahead and uh, they are sponsoring the next SF Marathon. So they want their uh, community admin, Eric Ware, to update this community uh, to have more of that messaging. And uh, they also want to recruit runners for the Rad Sports team. So let's see how Eric uh, goes ahead and does that. So he starts his journey off um, in community workspaces. For those who haven't uh, seen this before, this is your one-stop shop to build, manage, and moderate your community. So here, uh, we've actually introduced a new content management tile. So Eric wants to go ahead and uh, you know, create more content uh, that's ma marathon-related. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we did have the CMS Connect offering earlier where uh, you could pull in content from other CMS systems, whether it's AEM or WordPress. So if you have any JSON uh, content or if you have any HTML banners that you want to import, it's very seamless and very easy for you to do that. New for Winter 19, you can also whitelist your Salesforce CRM objects as content. Now, what does this mean? In the past, our customers, you know, they've had to create custom UIs. They have to, they've had to develop a lot of the, uh, you know, create custom objects and create custom UIs to uh, surface some of your CRM data. But starting in winter 19, you'll be able to use a lot of our out-of-the-box functionality to speed up your development with this. The third piece is uh, native content. So this is content that you've authored right here um, in the com in community cloud. And here's a sample content. So you can see it has a you know, title, it has a lot of rich text with um, images and formatted text. You have things like version history where you can actually archive your um, older versions, keep a version published, as well as work on a current draft. And you have topics as well. So topics are a great way for you to group related content together. So speaking about grouping related content, that's what a collection is all about, right? A collection is a way for you to uh, group content. So this collection here, the SF Featured Women, I put in four pieces of content that I uh, curated using a topic, and now I can feature this in the community. So now that you've seen uh, you know, all the content that's been created, let's go ahead and now populate this and uh, change our experience for the community. So you see that Eric's already gotten a little bit of a head start here. Uh, he started dropping in some components from uh, CMS Connect. There's a record list that he has out here. Um, I mentioned themes to you earlier. So one of the things I wanted to show you um, was the ability for you to be able to create and deploy a custom theme. So here we have the RAD theme uh, that we uh, went ahead and created for this, and we've deployed it. And uh, you know, theme is really a great way, if you haven't tried it already, to visually refresh your community. And uh, this is the new Rad Sports community now. You see that it has a beautiful banner with a run with Rad call to action, along with all of the other content. So now let's go ahead and uh, start populating some of this content here. When you start searching for uh, CMS in your components menu, and uh, by the way, guys, there's over 100 plus components that lets you pull in all kinds of data from Salesforce, whether it's cases or files, or anything under the sun, really. Um, so uh, we'll start off with a single item here. Uh, so I'll go ahead and drag and drop it onto the page, 
and uh, I'm going to add the same mental strength training content that I saw earlier. Um, and you see that it's already here on the, it's looking beautiful. Um, I mean, one of the key things I want to call out is our presentation and content is kind of decoupled, right? So you can go ahead and switch out to a different layout, keeping the same underlying data and get a different look and feel. Hmm. Um, so next, let's go ahead and drop in a collection of data. So collection, as I mentioned, is um, content list. And I'm going to choose the same SF featured women collection I showed you earlier. Um, one of the nice things about what we have here is you can actually customize this quite a bit. So, you know, I can just say, hey, I want four columns um, and one row that I want to display. I want to make sure that I have, a, let's say, a tile layout, which gives me a different look and feel, right? Um, I want to reduce my banner height. So there's all these different customizations um, you can actually do with um, this out of the box. Um, and uh, one of the really nice things we have here is being able to personalize this. So I can click into this arrow here. Uh, this pops up my audience targeting menu. And here I can go ahead and assign an audience. Um, so one of the nice things about Winter 19 is we've introduced operators. So this means if I wanted to define an audience like, uh, hey, I want somebody who's residing in San Francisco to see this, or maybe they've run more than four marathons, so they may be more invested to travel to San Francisco and take part in it. Um, so this is something that you can actually do. And uh, let's go ahead and assign this. That's how easy it is to personalize your uh, content for your audience. You can also personalize your page and branding sets and everything else as well. Um, last but not the least, let's talk about CRM data. So CRM, a lot of our customers want to use their CRM data in their communities but then they have to build a lot of custom UI. So here's like a race history um, custom object that I've created that's documenting all of the different races I've run over the uh, last year. Not really, but you know, it's a demo. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, drop in a CMS collection here, and I'm gonna choose that exact same list view that I have down there, which is the race history view, right? So I'm gonna select that, and you start seeing this visual shape the CRM data is taking. Um, like before, I'm going to go ahead and customize this a little bit. And, uh, you know, one of the really cool things about our uh, CRM offering is you can change content mapping, right? So with this, you can actually say, hey, my title, I want it to come from the time field in my CRM because that's the most important data point I want my users to see. My subtitle should be the race name. My image should be uh, coming in from the image URL field. And just like that, you see now that the same exact CRM data has a beautiful visual uh, look and feel. So let's go ahead and delete this other thing out. Um, and once done, I'm going to go ahead and preview this. I think this looks uh, you know, really good, um, whatever I've uh, created here. So we're good to publish. So Eric's work is not done here yet. Uh, what he really wants to do next is now recruit runners, right? So he goes ahead and uh, creates an email using our marketing journey builder, and he sends that email out to uh, Jessica. So Jessica is our um, avid runner who's uh, based out of San Francisco. She wants to really uh, participate in the Rad Sports team. She gets this beautiful email. She goes ahead and clicks on it. Um, and then she lands into the same Rad Sports community you saw earlier. One of the nice things uh, that I told you about Winter 19 is guest flows, right? So uh, with guest flows, even though uh, Jessica here is not authenticated, you know, she still has a flow, she still has a registration process uh, she can go and participate in. So let me go and register for her. So this is Jessica's email. Go ahead and select the gender. And then you can also do things like asking additional information even before uh, somebody is registering, right? So this is great for GDPR compliance if you want to know somebody's preference maybe, uh, if that's a use case you have for your community. And that's it. So Jessica is registered. Um, she sees a um, quick um, thank you for registering with the Rad Sports team. And she also sees a link to download her mobile app. Um, and that concludes our demo. Wow, mobile, yeah. mobile's big. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As you were going through this, I was checking out Twitter, and um, flows for guest users is getting a really great reaction. Mm -hmm. So we've got folks like Erica Stone Gilbert saying, finally, 
um, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> and we've got uh, Christian Sandor Knopp saying, um, community cloud, more and more, looks like a holistic way to create web presences. So I'm going to take that like a shout out. So yeah, I think it's a awesome. good thing. <laughs> um, I know that you're going to be talking about a lot of these things um, at Dreamforce, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think a couple of things that jumped out at me were GDPR, mm -hmm. which continues to be very high on everybody's mind mm -hmm. um, because we're just so interlinked globally these days. Um, and also mobile apps, mm -hmm. right? So I'm sure you're going um, to be talking about that together with your team. Mm -hmm. um, at Dreamforce, mm -hmm. and ideally we can have you talk more about these in webinars in the future. Um, are there any other sessions for developers that you think um, would be super interesting for people that um, were fascinated by this? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we have a lot of sessions uh, for Dreamforce in the Dev Forest area, and you know, I spoke a lot about content and audience targeting today. And one of the sessions that I, uh, I think would be really great is uh, best practices for you when you're thinking about content for your community, whether it's CMS Connect or whether it is um, using our native CMS platform, how do you actually create content and then personalize it? So we'll be sharing all those tips and tricks and best practices uh, in that session. Um, I think you're going to be sharing out the details for it later I will on, be right? sharing out the details, yeah. but that's just one? <laughs> <laughs> there are many more. I think, I, I think I've included a slide which has all of that. Yeah. yeah, we'll be sharing more of that soon. And of course, um, if you're not a developer, you're also, as you mentioned before, going to be talking about Community Cloud later on next week, right? Yeah. Great. Um, thank you. So as we were chatting, um, there were a couple of questions coming in for you, Rohit, mm -hmm. about Salesforce DX, but I'll save them um, sure. for the very end um, because we're still waiting for uh, for Greg to share what's new with Lightning. <laughs> oh, you are. Yes, we are. <laughs> Guess what? I'm waiting to show that too. <laughs> So this is this is a match made in heaven, Arabella. It's awesome. <laughs> but you know what? I'm going to start actually in a place that developers may not even know exists. Um, you know, and, and as as you well know, I've been out on the road over the last two years, even going back to before I became a PM. I was on the evangelism team, mm -hmm. talking about Lightning Now and Lightning adoption, right, on our Lightning Now tours. Mm -hmm. And you know, those tours are designed to bring developers up to speed on how to build on the Lightning platform. But you know, one of the things that very often happens is, you know, I'm a developer. I'm building these components and things like that. And I want to know, are people even using this? I mean, you know, in a lot of orgs, there's people that are on Classic, there's people that are on Lightning, right? And so last release, we actually launched something uh, called the Lightning Usage app. And Lightning uses app is really cool because it allows admins or even developers, whoever's interested in, in, in this kind of information, to drill in and sort of see behind the scenes with their org is what's going on for those Lightning users. Now, we've done a lot of new improvements here with the Lightning usage app here in uh, Winter 19. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we can do is we can show you, for example, your switches to Classic. We can show you what are the top 10 pages that are, are causing users to switch back to Classic for, right? Right? That's pretty that's, granular. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. But another thing, especially as a developer that I'm interested in, is understanding the, the target audience. Who are my users out there? What browsers are they on, for example? I mean, we all you know, tend to think, oh, I'm a developer. I'm on Chrome. Everybody must be on Chrome. But you know, out in the real world, that's not true. So one of the great things is you're a developer. You're getting your page laid out. You're adding a bunch of components. And now in the Usage app, we can actually go in and look at performance by browser. So we can actually go in and see how your org, how your individual pages, the top 10 pages, for example, are performing in those various browsers. And then best of all, you know, the people up the food chain, they want reports. We can now even create custom reports using those Lightning Usage app, um, app objects um, to generate out reports for those people that are interested in, in knowing that kind of information. So, you know, not something that developers typically um, think about and, and, and spend a lot of time looking at, but definitely something worth knowing is available for in our toolbox. Is that what's being shown on the on the side of that slide here? That is. Those those charts are actually coming directly from the Lightning Usage app. Exactly right. Great. Yeah. So let's uh, let's actually change change gears a little bit because yes, everybody's moving to Lightning, but are they all moving to Lightning components? 
as much as I would love it being the product owner for uh, Lightning Components, I do know that some people are still out there, they're using Visual Force. And that's great because we want you to come on into Lightning. You can continue to build in Lightning using Visual Force. But one of the things that we've heard is that, yeah, that's great. But, you know, in Classic, I do a lot of overrides. And a lot of times I'm doing those overrides with Visual Force. And we've given you that capability inside of Lightning with a little caveat down there at the bottom that says, except in console apps. <laughs> well, now in Winter 19, that's no longer the case because in Winter 19, we are now giving you the ability to bring over your overrides there with Visual Force, uh, allowing us to override new, edit, view, and so on with your Visual Force pages in, in your uh, console application. That's great. So yeah, that's really <laughs> gonna be huge, all right? But now, my passion. <laughs> well, actually, no, one more thing before I talk about my passion. Because, just one. Yeah, just one more. <laughs> All right. And that is something that, you know, as developers, we've been dealing with for a little while now, several releases, oh, well, maybe even over a year now, a year and a half almost, that we've uh, had locker service, right? And locker service for many of us is sort of a black box. We know it's there, but we don't really understand how it works until such time as something happens in our component and it all breaks and we don't understand why, right? And so that's why with the Winter Night release, we want to expose some of those inner workings of locker service. And we're doing it in a place that I hope you know where it is, but if you don't, I'm going to show you how to get there in a minute. But that is called the component library. So within the component library, we now will expose the API for a locker. So you can actually go in and view those API and API calls, and you can even play around with it. So if you got a piece of JavaScript code, you're not sure, is this locker compliant? Is it going to pass it? Um, you can actually use uh, a playground, a little console there, and, uh, and test it out and see what the results are going to be there in the component library. But I'll show you that to you in just a minute. Can we measure how much easier that's going to make everybody's lives? Um, <laughs> yes, there's actually, we've actually done a, a deep bit of research. We have a number, it's called a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's very scientific. very scientific. I see it. I, I see. Yes. So it's 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 increased by two a lot. Yes, two a lot. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> exactly right. All right. So now on to my on to my favorite topic, and that is uh, lightning components. Um, now, as you know, we've been producing these base components now for many, many releases, going all the way back to summer 16. And with each release, we give you more and more base components. Now, I get the ideas for these base components uh, not only out of my own wishful thinking, but also from you, our developers out there. So uh, please let me know what components are missing. What are the things that you, you feel like you need? If you're a Visual Force developer and you're saying, hey, you know, I've got this Visual Force tag that does X, Y, or Z. You know, hey, give me give me a shout out. Let me know if that would be something you'd like to see as a um, as a Lightning component, for example. So these are these are you know th this graph is sort of showing that we are doing a lot of these, uh, and we've been doing it over uh, you know as I said the last several releases. But you might notice that that is actually that that whole um, chart is missing a couple of releases. You know, like it doesn't even have summer release that we just had. And why is that? Well, Arabella, I've got a, a confession to make, and that's, that's um, a trick I learned back in my evangelism days. You know, you make the chart look a little bit better by leaving out some data, <laughs> right? So uh, the reason I did that is because you'll notice from spring to winter, we've only gone up by uh, two whole components. That's right. Sometimes, you know, I give you a lot of components. Sometimes I only give you one. I, I know yeah. I wasn't going to say something. I was being polite. Well, uh, I know. I know. That out there. So there you go. <laughs> so the big reveal in Winter 19, we do have but one new base component. Now, that's not to say we haven't been working, right? We've not been sitting around eating bonbons at the pool, right? We've actually been working. <laughs> we've been working on existing components. So we've improved a lot of those existing components. For example, um, accordion. Uh, a lot of you out there said, well, you know, I, I, I like the accordion component, but I can only open one accordion pane at a time. Mm -hmm. I'd like to be able to open multiple. 
Well, you can now do that in winter 19. And there's a whole bunch. I mean, literally, it's, there's 20 or 25 different components that have gotten updates and refreshes and new capabilities uh, in winter 19. But that one new component, I'm really, really proud of. This one Yay! is called Lightning Map. <laughs> wow. Yes. Everyone's going to love it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how many times I've been asked, you know, how do I get a map into my Lightning component? And I've had to tell you all about kludgy workarounds or static resources and all sorts of things. Well, now you have the power of Google uh, and Google Maps right there in the Lightning Map component. Nice. So, you want to <laughs> see that, Arabella? Well, hmm, let me, yes. Okay, all right. <laughs> so let's go to the demo over here. But I'm going to actually start here on developer.salesforce.com. Because as I said, I, I was talking about that component library, and I want to make sure that everyone knows where to find the component library. Now, you may not even know this, but we released the component library several releases ago, mm -hmm. and we hit it really well so no one could find it. We didn't do that intentionally. We were just testing out the waters. Of, would this be something interesting? And so in the previous release, in the summer release, we actually moved it over here under de developer.salesforce.com where you'll find that Lightning Component Library. And when I click on that, that takes me over to my library. Now, it's going to give me a preview of a lot of things that are that are here inside of, of the, the library. But one thing that I want to point out is that there's also this login button here or this link to your org button. Now, when you do that, and I've actually done that in a different org, actually, you're going to see something new appearing over here in the left-hand side, not just my lightning components that you can see here. I also have this weird one here called C. That's actually my own namespace. That, these are my own components here within my own org. Now, this is both good news and bad news. The good news is I can actually see all the org or the components that I've created. The bad news is my friends, my fellow developers out there, whoops, and I'm getting an error by clicking on that one, because as you see, I have no documentation here. Tisk tisk. Why? Because that <laughs> developer didn't write any documentation Shame. for their component. So really important there that you know that. Okay, but what's really also cool is the fact that in, when we go back to these components, let's talk about, I'll just go all all the way back to the main list here. One of the really cool and sort of hidden features is up here, my filters. So if you're wanting to know, you know, Gigi, you were just talking about communities. If I want to know what are the components that work in communities, I can simply select that here and it's going to show me only the components that are, that are applicable to my filtering. Right? But I was talking about that locker service console and API viewer. So let's go check that out. So here we have the locker uh, service API. I can see all the various API calls and, and uh, what they actually do here. But then more importantly, as I said, I have this locker service console. And that gives me the ability, let's just do something simple. We all know that locker service locks us away from Windows. So with locker service on, if I try to figure out what is the value of window, we're going to see that it actually is going to resolve to my secure window. But if I wasn't on locker service, and I didn't have that turned on, then we would see that that was going to, to re, um, resolve to the actual browser's window. So again, really, really helpful as a developer to know what's going on in that JavaScript code that I'm creating. But we were here to look at map, right? So let's go ahead <laughs> yeah, and switch on over us. into my org. And there <laughs> you go. There is a Google map. Yes, it is interactive. Yes, I can zoom in. I can zoom out. Th yes, I can turn on my satellite view. This is Google Maps in your Lightning component. And I know you want to know, how did I do it? How did you do that? Well, let's go look <laughs> at my map, at my markup, and here you go. There it is, a single line of code. That is, of course, the essence of base components is a single line of code that turns into magic. And in fact, here we see lightning map. I've got some map markers. Where are they coming from? Well, actually, first thing I'm doing here is I'm actually using lightning data service to load the record that I'm currently on. And once it does that, it's actually going to trigger a do init function that's going to go out and figure out what is the address, city, and state 
And what do I want to display as a name and title, for example, on my markers? And that's all there is to it to give me that wonderful map that we see appearing here. One of line. course, if I want, of course, there is a little bit more. If I wanted to and I wanted to add multiple, then I would simply set my map markers as I'm doing here to multiple locations. And it is going to drop then all of those markers onto my map uh, for me as well. And each one of the markers, of course, will have the little hover over and I can click on it and preview to see what uh, the detail, the title and the description are that I've given to that. So I think it's going to be really, really powerful. A lot of people are really going to enjoy that, uh, that new component. So so can people get their hands on it right now? That is in winter <laughs> 19, absolutely. But you know, since I only had a single component to share with you. It's an awesome component though. Oh, I think so. <laughs> but do you but want... you've also been improving all of the other oh, components. Oh, yeah, exactly. We've been improving all the others. <laughs> but then there's also something that my team has been working with uh, one of my fellow teams on, um, and that is working with the Lightning Data Service team. Now, I called them out for being able to uh, uh, to tell me what record I'm on without me having to write APEX, right? I love Lightning Data Service. I've been using it uh, in almost every component that I've built over the last year. But one of the problems that we've, that we've seen, now we know, right, with Lightning Data Service, just to make sure that everyone understands, let's go back over here to our demo. And I'm just going to change the name of the street here. I'm just going to make it be, oops, that is, if I can type here, just make this be ST. And I'm going to go ahead and save this. And when I do, you're going to notice that over here on my component, that actually the title updated as well. And it updated because it's using Lightning Data Service behind the scenes to keep in track with that particular record. But there still is one challenge that we've had and that we still have, and that is, what if I've got another user and another user is editing my record? That never happens. Never happens, right? <laughs> never, ever happens, right? Um, well, except for every minute of the day, right? <laughs> so what happens if another user is editing a record? Well, in today's world, Arabella, how do you get the new value? Simple, you just refresh the page. Mm -hmm. But that's not good, yeah. right? So I wanna show you something. And the reason I'm showing this is because in winter 19, we have this as a pilot. Now, this is an opt-in pilot, and I know, you know some people go, wait, what does that mean? What that means is if you have a customer success manager or your account executive, you can talk to them and get yourself nominated and join the pilot. So what you're saying is you bring those bonbons to those folks next to the pool. Exactly okay. right, exactly <laughs> right. But I think it's gonna be, the trip to the pool is gonna be worth it, Arabella, you see, because let's go ahead and edit this record. We're gonna raise the price here. The market's going really good in Boston, so I'm gonna raise the price of this property to 750. Now this is my user, my one user. I'm in a completely different browser window, all right? Let's see I'm it. just gonna go ahead and hit save, and then look at that magically over there in the background, I didn't do anything. Nice. And it just <laughs> updated. Now, I can hear the cheering and the applause going on out there in the, in the community right now, because that is massive. So this is called push data uh, cache invalidation. Push data cache invalidation. Invalida That's yeah. a mouthful. It is. It is. I'm sure we'll come up with some name like lightning something, but like, I don't know. That's it's, for, it's your... Well, that's, area, for, that's right? well, that's, that's <laughs> one of my one of my colleagues is actually the, the, the product manager over that. So we'll see what they come up with in terms of a name. But that is really really cool. But we still have one more thing. You're covering so much awesome stuff. Right, I think you right. need to like pause for okay. a minute to let us absorb it. Uh, go no, on. here we go. <laughs> last one. Last one. That's great. So now we have with Lightning Data Service. I have components on a page that can listen to things happening on the page. They can talk to one another. They can talk to the the main page. Now with this new pilot feature for the push invalidation or cache invalidation, now I've even got other users modifying data and my components and my page are updating. So what going Except on there? Except for one thing. Visual Force. Right? Okay. Visual Force <laughs> 
here I have a Visual Force page, right? This is a this is a Visual Force page that is embedded here. I'll just go ahead and refresh so you can see. Uh, this is a Visual Force page that is embedded inside of Lightning. So, right, it's gonna it's it's working fine, except for the fact that once it loads here, I'm gonna go back over here, oops, over here to my escalate here, and I'm just gonna say we're gonna need to escalate this. We're going to um, uh, make it happen, right? I want to make this happen. I want to hit save, and as you see. The page refreshed, but nothing that I wrote over here did in the Visual Force page. So I've not gotten the updates, and I don't want that, right? So let me just refresh to show you that, in fact, the, the record was saved, but it's not until we refresh that we can see the make it happen, mm -hmm. okay? Now that's the world that we've lived in. But again, now not only do we have the push data cache and validation uh, pilot, we also have the same pilot for Visual Force. So let's go in and edit this page. And I'm just gonna add in a new line of code. I'm gonna say Apex and a brand new thing called Live Controller. I'll go ahead and do a quick save here. And we'll go back over. We'll refresh our page just to let that Visual Force page reload and let it now know it is capable of receiving messages from the Live Controller. And what is that going to mean? Well, that's, going, that's going to mean, whoops, let me scroll over here. That's going to mean that I'm going to go and say, oh, not make it happen. I mean, make it happen now. And we're going to go ahead and hit save. And we will see that as we did there magically, our Visual Force page has updated as well. So, Arabella, I know this is the Winter 19 preview. But not only do we have cool stuff, as you can see in Winter 19, we've got some really cool stuff coming for a future release, but people can get into it now mm -hmm. by joining the pilot. Talk to your, your account executive or your success manager and, and get it in, get into it and, and let us know uh, what you think about it. Yeah, that's why we have pilots, right? It's because we want people to kick the tires on it and, and really give you that straight feedback. Absolutely. So, um, people are super excited for the um, Lightning Components Library. So cool. show me one more time where they can find that. Okay, one more time. <laughs> We're going to go back over here to the demo <clears throat> one more time. So anytime you needed it, developer.salesforce.com. In the resources uh, uh, link here or tab, you can just go right down there to the Lightning Component Library. Yep. Um, and then I would just recommend doing what I do. I bookmarked it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that way I don't ever, ever even have to think. I can just hit my bookmark and off I go. I just keep all of my tabs open. Mm -hmm. Always. You know, my wife My <laughs> wife does that. You know? Yeah, I think her record is 157 tabs open at one time. Zero performance issues, I'm sure. No, so. no. <laughs> the best thing is just the little teeny icon that you can barely see in the tabs. You know it. <laughs> so yeah. that or bookmark it like Greg does. Exactly. Um, so we've got a lot of questions coming in. Um, I think, uh, oh, the first one is from Squire Kirshner. Uh, it is, what is the standard deviation of a lot? <laughs> Don't no spin take. <laughs> Was it Spencer? No, uh, the Squire Kirshner. Oh, Squire, you almost caused me to spew all over Rohit's Please, laptop. Please, no, we're not done yet. <laughs> 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 so I don't. I, I actually don't know. I'll have to get with the researcher to figure out what a lot is and double a lot is. But. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the next question that we have is uh, it's from the community. Um, would it be possible to configure an object to have a visual force override only in classic? Like if we don't need the visual and lightning because it's flexible. So let me understand the question again. Yeah, um, when you're doing those overrides, there are checkboxes to say, or do, do you want to override in classic or do you want to override in lightning? So those are separate overrides. Okay, so th that's the answer then. Mm -hmm. You'll yeah. just have to do it separately. Okay. And um, another one is from Peter Knoll. So the lightning component library makes developing so much easier. So shout out. <laughs> um, interactive Google Map Lightning, people are never going to get lost again. So, <laughs> ever. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> yeah, the forward looking statement. Right, exactly. You're never going to get lost again. Exactly. So, <laughs> um, can I, this is from uh, Christopher Wagner. And uh, can I use the new Lightning Map components on collections of custom fields on custom objects representing address pieces? Or is this just for standard address fields on lead, 
account contacted user. So that's the beautiful thing. We built the Lightning Map to take whatever data you provide. Basically, all you're doing is providing a JSON structure um, that, is, that you call map markers. And inside of that JSON structure is a location object that has the city, state, or you know, street, city, uh, state, or if you prefer, latitude and longitude. You can pass that as well. Uh, and so we literally don't care where that data is coming from. It can come from uh, a standard object, an address field, uh, um, or it can be a custom object, or you could query Yelp, and which I actually might have a component that I may be showing at Dreamforce um, <laughs> that may do that very same thing. So I can mash the data up even with my Salesforce data and data coming from an external source because it literally is just my own map markers object that I create. Great. I'm, the, I, I'm super curious to hear how this, this gets picked up. Because Me I mean, just judging from the enthusiasm I'm seeing. <laughs> <laughs> Me so too. we've got another one from uh, Erica Stone Gilbert. Um, she said she'd love to be able to have shape layers to do things like draw counties and postal codes. Is that on the horizon? Well, so, so oh, believe me, there's so much on the horizon. <laughs> um, between Google Maps and uh, Lightning Data Table, I could fill up probably the next five releases with, <laughs> with features. Um, so that is a, it's a great uh, great question, though. So initially, this is we are I'm releasing the Google Maps uh, or the Lightning Map um, component as a beta because I do know there's a lot of things that we just simply couldn't get into this one. Um, that we want to get in uh, in the future releases. So look for it to go GA probably in spring. Um, but yes, we will be adding in more and more features. I can't tell you exactly when each one will come because of course, um, you know, there are a lot of features and we have to prioritize those. Um, but yes, we want to keep we want to keep enhancing Google Map uh, and as well as the data table and, and, and a lot of the other components that uh, we're working on. Okay, great, thanks. And so we have one here from uh, Cheryl Feldman. Hey, Cheryl. Hey, Cheryl. Um, <laughs> and she's saying one of my DF18 goals is to meet you and talk about lightning components and show you how we're using them. So Awesome, awesome. Keep Looking eye out. forward to it, Cheryl. <laughs> Looking forward to it. You, you should stuff. be you, you should be able to find me pretty easily. I I've, I've got four sessions. Um, four as now. Well. Yeah, well, it's actually three, but one of them's being repeated, so it's... Uh, Can I tell a bit of, about them? Yeah, yep. well, yeah, so uh, I've got two in, in the uh, theaters. Um, one is, uh, my boss just told me to build a lightning component. Now what? That's you the know? title. That's the title. Just that's, that's, it. <laughs> that's it. So if you've ever had that happen to you, come see that session. That will, that will be for all of you out there who are just starting your lightning components journey. Um, if you're into your Lightning Components journey and you want to see some other cool things that you can do, if you've never looked at uh, the design parameters, for example, um, I've got a whole session on design parameters. In other words, how do I unlock capabilities within my component so that my admin or other developers, when they're in uh, the app builder putting that component on the page, they can actually specify attributes and things that that component should do. Maybe make it bigger, make it smaller. Um, use this text, don't use that text. Uh, show five markers on the on the Google map instead of just one or whatever it might, uh, might be. Anything that I can expose um, within my own component, I can expose as a design parameter for app builder users to actually configure that component. And then finally, my favorite one, I've got a breakout session, it's called uh, from Markup to Magic, the evolution of Lightning Components. I'm going to take you on a journey over the last two years of how we built two years ago and how we're building today. And just a spoiler alert, we're going to go from about 150 lines of HTML markup in my component down to five. <laughs> That does sound like magic. It does, It right? takes about 40 minutes. That takes about 40 <laughs> minutes to do that magic, yeah, because I talk a lot. <laughs> nah. <laughs> so I think we, um, as, as you were chatting about the sessions, I, I got a question in from AJ. Um, so uh, can we also find the distance between two markers in Lightning Map? So that's not currently available, but yes, that is definitely on the roadmap. Great. So thank you. Um, we have another, a few other questions that have been coming in. So I'll just start firing off in random directions. So get ready to catch them. <laughs> so we've got one um, for Gigi. Uh, can you? It's, a, it's from Pavel. Uh, uh, Pavel, uh, and he is asking, can you include login to community as part of an unauthenticated, an unauthenticated flow? 
Need more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I do believe so. Um, I'm not the PM on that feature, but that's something we can definitely get back to you on Twitter. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, and then, um, let's see here. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about the mobile app for communities? Yeah, so uh, the mobile app, I kind of hinted at it a little bit in the demo. Uh, this is something that's in pilot right now. Uh, if you're coming to Dreamforce, you'll definitely be able to uh, learn more. And our uh, goal is to you know, build that up and GA it, hopefully, over the next couple of releases. Uh, but it's a way for you to uh, bring, build out a hybrid mobile app container. Um, so this is, uh, you know, out of the box, you can actually have your community work as a hybrid mobile app, and then you can have all of the mobile functionality like push notifications, uh, be able to, let's say, change profile picture and things like that by accessing functionality on your phone right within the app itself. Great. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Rohit, you ready? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, is there anything special or any restrictions with DE being a hub org, or is it just a simple toggle? That's a great question. Um, so the DE uh, use case that we built out was for developers to try out all the new tooling as that, that we rolled out over the last year. Um, we expect developers to use this for their training and their, not their, you know, their knowledge purposes. So uh, while they're doing trail-in modules, going through the documentation, um, checking out some of the sessions at Dreamforce, uh, that's what this uh, DE org is, is main, meant for. For any production use cases, such as CI, um, or building your packages, we know that those use cases require many more scratch orgs. And so for those use case, cases, we ask developers to use their production org or their business org if they're a partner. Okay. Yeah. So one other thing also to call out is when you build a package or and a package version, that is associated with the dev hub org. Um, and so if you want the dev hub, um, if you want the package version to never expire, uh, you shouldn't do so in a, in a DE org or a trial orgs. Because as those orgs expire, uh, we will clean away those package versions, and you don't want to lose those. You really don't want to lose those. Right, you don't want to lose those. <laughs> OK, that's great to know. So pro tip for people that are doing this. Um, another question we have here is, uh, how is metadata decomposition progressing? Um, it's actually progressing quite well. There, there will be a bunch of, different, a bunch of updates at uh, Dreamforce that we will announce. Uh, I'm not the product manager for that area, but uh, we have some sessions where we will be covering this topic. Um, and it is a work in progress. So we are actively working on, uh, on on addressing some of the feedback that we have heard on the community. OK. I hope that got your question, Christian. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about those sessions where you'll be talking about these? Absolutely. So there is a session on, on almost each of the different aspects of developer experience. There is a session on uh, scratch orgs and environments. Uh, there will be one on metadata and, and application lifecycle management, uh, on the Salesforce CLI, and all the updates to the VS Code plugin. Uh, so you should definitely check out the one for the metadata questions. Check out the one on metadata. OK, great. That's an easy search on Agenda Builder, I think. Yes. <laughs> the, the next question is also from uh, Christian. And it is, uh, I love all the updates for code presented by you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I dearly miss easy refactoring support. And is that on the roadmap? Um, it's definitely something that we have ta thought about as we are building out all the use cases that were supported by um, other uh, tools, such as the force.com IDE. Uh, so in the Winter 19 update, uh, there, this is a beta release for uh, the VS Code uh, plugin for other orgs besides Scratch orgs. Uh, in the future releases, we will be adding additional uh, features there. OK. Thank you for that. So a few more coming in. Um, the next one is from uh, Tad. And for CLI deployment, would it be possible to give deployments a name or label? Some migration tools have cryptic namings. That's great feedback. Again, this is a beta feature, um, so please keep sending us that feedback. Um, I don't believe we can we can label those deployments, uh, but this is something that I can see definitely a use case for. Oh, great! <laughs> this is this is I think feedback in action. Yes. So I love I yes. love this is the reason why these live broadcasts are so great. Right. Um, another question uh, for Greg. So this whole thing about getting into the pilot. <laughs> so what do you suggest for bribery? Like, how do you, what's, um, what do you recommend? What have you seen? What do you prefer to get hooked up with the uh, account manager? And more specifically, 
Um, a question from Matthew Poe. Uh, what specific info do developers need to give their account executives to try to get into the pilot? No guarantees. Yeah. So. Well, basically, they just need to, to uh, talk with either their um, customer success uh, person or their account manager. Hit us up on, on uh, any of the uh, success community. Um, that kind of that kind of thing, just uh, to let us know. Hey, I'm interested. This is you know this is who we are. This is our org. Uh, blah blah blah. You know, and it, basically it's a nomination process, and we're very strict about who we let in. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, at this point, what we want is we want to get you uh, involved. So um, so we want to get you on onboarded. Uh, let you know you know this is what to expect. But uh, other than that, yeah, it's not, it's not a great process uh, in, or, or a hard process to get involved with the pilot. It's pretty hands-on, I think, once you're in the pilot, right? Yeah, and, so. well, and, and here's the best thing, <laughs> um, which I didn't mention. Um, that invalidation thing that we saw going on, it is exactly this many lines of code for developers. Do they get, how many? I didn't. That one. Zero. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Zero, Zero lines of code. Zero lines of code. <laughs> Zero lines of code because it's all happening under the covers. Okay. So. What do I have to do as a developer to, to subscribe to any of this or to get all the goodness? Absolutely nothing. It's just, <laughs> it's just happening. He was so That's shocked. So shocking. <laughs> so shocking. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. We got yeah. like a almost spit take. We have like some <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is nuts. Um, great. Okay. So basically, no tips on bribery, but do you talk to your account. Oh, well, you know, I mean, a hundred dollars <laughs> slid to me at Dreamforce. You know, that would definitely. You know. And you'll be you'll be at the booths, right? And I'll be at the booths. Yeah, I'll be wandering around. Which yeah. booths will you be at? I'll be at the Lightning Components booth. You never would have guessed. <laughs> <laughs> So if he's not on stage, exactly. <laughs> get your money ready. The ATMs are around the corner from Moscow New West. <laughs> Actually, that stands for all of you. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about bribery, but you know, you'll all be at the at the demo booths, right? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, we have one more question. Um, well, hopefully, we'll have a few more. But the one I'm seeing right now is uh, does it's from uh, Gordon, and does the new live data pilot include data changed by Apex in the background? You know, that's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but we could definitely get an answer for you. I'm going to go out on a limb and say probably, but I don't can't confirm that. You're going to go out on a limb and say probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because think about it. Think about it. I was in one browser. I saved it. The data got updated on the server, and then the other browser updated. Is that via Apex? It's, mm -hmm. Is this when you just start saying magic? That's just when I say magic, okay. exactly. <laughs> Big hands, wave a lot. Okay. You know, yeah. We remain cautiously optimistic. We remain cautiously optimistic. <laughs> but if they want a real answer, we can get a real answer for them. Okay. Um, and so the real answer is uh, at Garazi at Twitter. Right? Uh, you can try that one. <laughs> <laughs> what and, and what are your Twitters again? So you're at Rohit Force, Force. right? So Ro to Rohit's at Rohit Force. And then, uh, which one's yours? Mine's uh, Guy Three RG. Guy Three RG. Yep. Okay, great. And then CRC. Oh wow, a three-letter Twitter handle. Easy. Yeah. yeah. You are old school. Early adopter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a few more a, a few more questions. We've only got a few more minutes left, um, but we'll see how many we can cram in here. Um, this one's for uh, for you, Gigi. And is there a cost associated with what you just walked through? No, the good news is it's all uh, included. If you have a Lightning community, everything mm -hmm. I spoke about is included in there. It's all it's all included. Yes, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so no pilots, no sneaking around, right? Nope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Communities offers a free CDN. Uh -huh. Could you give us a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, so uh, the CDN that we have, it's a partnership with Akamai. I believe every um, org gets about five terabytes of uh, uh, storage there. And uh, it's actually GA for winter 19, so go check it out. can definitely help with performance. And that's it's all it's all we're about is improving the performance of the apps and yes. building apps more quickly, right? Absolutely. So, <laughs> um, one more question from um, Girish. Um, Apologies if I just slaughtered that uh, <laughs> coffee. <laughs> so um, can we edit the label near the map tooltip marker for the new lightning map component? So edit the label for the... Near the map tooltip marker. 
So that tooltip marker is the one that's built in or that comes from Google. We're not doing anything special. So that is the one that's coming from Google. Currently, we're not going to provide any formatting or uh, um, uh, customization capabilities. Literally, as I said, I, this is going out as a beta uh, component because we want to get it out there. I didn't want you to wait any longer. I've been trying to get it out for two straight releases. So uh, we've finally gotten over those hurdles. Um, but as I said, you know, we do have things on the on the roadmap for the map component. So if, if it's not there now, you know, look for it down the road in, in a future release. Okay, great. Cautiously optimistic. Cautiously optimistic. <laughs> Cautiously optimistic, big hands waving, forward-looking <laughs> statement flashing down here, you know, the whole nine yards. Well, great. Thank you for that. Um, so let's see. I've, I've got time for maybe two more questions. Um, and then I'll share the, that uh, trail mix link. So let's see here. <clears throat> we have one. Um, oh, I don't have a Dreamforce ticket. Um, how do I learn about what's new for Salesforce DX? Oh, so we have a ton of resources available online. There are a few uh, Trailhead modules that we made available on Trailhead. Uh, there are some amazing blogs written by our developer evangelists um, that walk you through the process of um, creating, for example, a Salesforce CLI plugin um, to a bunch of other uh, neat tricks that you can do with, with all the tooling that we built. Uh, besides that, you can also check out all the sessions that are recorded and made available after Dreamforce. Um, so you can check out videos from previous Dreamforces, Trailhead DX, um, but also the ones that will be posted after this one. Yep, we'll be posting them on the developer site, which is great. Yeah. Um, Chris, on the Heroku front, you're, yeah. you're super organized on like what all of the things your, your team is doing, right? Yeah. So where do people go to learn more about that? The developer forest, uh, <laughs> Moscone West at Dreamforce is where people go to learn more about that. Is that what you're asking about Dreamforce? Um, there's or that, in and general? then there's also there's some sessions you're doing. And yeah, then... so we've got um, 10 to 20, maybe even more Heroku sessions. It's a lot. Um, yeah, Heroku-related sessions. Some are about using uh, Salesforce data together with Heroku. Some are about kind of uh, deeper topics like microservices on Heroku and using Apache Kafka. It's hot um, topics. I think Philanthropy Cloud, uh, which is built on Heroku, is doing a, a session also uh, explaining how they have built Philanthropy Cloud, Philanthropy Cloud on Heroku. You know, what's also exciting, though, is if we go to the next slide, um, we can see that um, uh, we have uh, Margaret from Heroku yes. who's going to be hosting our Salesforce developer keynote. Yeah. And we're super excited about that. So take a moment to bookmark that. Um, Margaret's hosting as well as some familiar faces that do amazing stuff. So we have Christoph Konrads, who's a ninja with the Lightning components. He'll be talking about how you can build apps faster. Um, Zane Turner, um, who was here with the Dreamforce keynote last year, the developer keynote, she'll be talking about how you can integrate apps easier. And then uh, Chin Chin Lu uh, with Einstein will be talking about how you can make your apps smarter. So we're really looking forward to that. And as promised, uh, you can learn more uh, from Dreamforce uh, and the new release readiness uh, Winter 19 release by taking the Winter 19 Trail Mix. And we'll share that link uh, online as well. So as we close out, I want to say thank you one more time. I know it's been exhausting. I know that your weekends have been gone <laughs> for at least the last couple of months as we've been getting ready for Dreamforce. But you have been so great to come and share what's new for Winter 19 with us today. So thank you again. Yeah. I appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's been fun. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Bye.